。好，那我们的时间差不多了，那我们今天下午的呃议程是从十二点五十开始哦。那我们这个议程轨是 JVN 联合国议程轨，然后我们下午议程从十二点五十开始，一路到呃四点结束。那我们接下来这一场的议程是这个 Writing OS Update r App for Android，Writing OS Update r App for Android。那嗯，我们这一场也是由这个呃外国讲师<咳>来跟我们分享。OK， so um。Welcome to our JVN unit session, and this session will start on uh, 12.50 until um, 4 p.m. And this topic will talk about writing OS updater app for Android. Let's welcome Ayush. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Aish Gupta. I'm currently working as an Android developer for the Calix Institute. Uh, we mainly work on an Android open source project-based operating system known as Calix OS, which is a security and privacy-based operating system. Uh, recently, I had a chance to write a system update application at Calix, and because of that, I kind of looked deep into how the system updates work on Android and how someone can very easily write a new system update application if they wish to. I didn't find quite a lot of talks, so here I am giving one. Uh, moving on to the agenda very quickly, as you can see, there's, well, the whole talk can be divided into basically two parts, which is the very first one would cover information on, on how the system updates work on Android, uh, which would be covering legacy system update, which is how they used to work till Android 8.0 and how they work now. And then we will use that knowledge of how system updates work to write a very simple and easy system update application. Moving to legacy system updates. By legacy, it's kind of ki already evident that this was used to, but not in practice anymore. Uh, in case you have bought an uh, Android phone, smartphone in around like five to six years ago, which was not released with Android 8.0. So that means that your phone still uses the legacy system updates. Legacy system updates, or the devices which support them, are known as non-AB devices. What does AB means here? I will cover it into a couple of next slides. Um, in these devices, the whole storage is divided into several partitions. Uh, the red ones that you can see are the system-related partitions. On this partition, your operating system lives on, which is, as you can see, boot system vendor. Boot contains the uh, files required for booting your Android system on your phone. System contains the files which are present in the Android open source project. These files are open source, and anyone can see and download them. The vendor, however, contains the file that your manu smartphone manufacturer codes and writes. So they are proprietary files, and so they are in vendor. Nowadays, there have been more partitions, but for the sake of this presentation, let's assume there are only three partitions in system. Now, the, all, as I said, the whole storage is divided into several other partitions. Uh, the green one is the user data, which is the internal storage that is made available to you by the smartphone manufacturer. And let's say that if you buy a smartphone and they say you have 32 GB of internal storage, but you only get around 20 or 15 GB of usable space, right? You don't get all 32 GB for you to use. Uh, the rest of them is the system one, while the user data, which is the remaining 20 or 25 GB that is made available to you. Then, as we are talking about updates, the yellow ones are responsible on legacy devices, which are the old devices on installing updates on your phone. There is a recovery partition. Recovery partition contains basically a small Linux kernel. It's self-sufficient. It doesn't interfere with the red one. So it's completely independent of the operating system that your device is running on. It is responsible for installing the updates, verifying the signatures are correct or not, and everything else. It uses cache partition to read commands that your system will write and then reboot to recovery. Then there is a MISC partition. MISC partition basically stores lockouts. Um, and if your smartphone manufacturer wants to store something else, they will also use the MISC partition. Other than that, there's not much for the legacy devices. Now here's how the update process works in general on legacy devices. 
your smartphone or basically the updated application will check for the update and then download that. It will be basically in other cache partition or the user data. Then it will verify the uh, update signature with the system to ensure that it is actually coming from your smartphone manufacturer and not some malicious third party. If the signature matches, it will simply reboot to recovery and then re recovery will verify the signature again just to be sure that it's the same file that system has provided to it. Once it matches, it will basically simply install the update and reboot again. And then you get access to your system. Quite simple and easy, right? And then again, if system checks, if it should update the recovery itself, which means that maybe recovery has outdated, system wants something different on the next part time update. So system will simply run a new bash script or something and it will update the recovery partition. Now, as I said, this is the legacy system update and not the latest one. So comes the question of why. Why was this not being used anymore? And the answer to that is there have been quite a lot of issues with how update used to work on Android. The very top one is that the updater application had to handle the storage space because basically when the let's say that you are downloading a file, your application is downloading a file on the device, you need to take care that there is enough free space available. Then after you have used the file, you need to free up the space again. You don't want your application to take 2 GB, 2 GB and filling up the internal storage. Anyone will get angry on that. Then the second point, which is another big point, is that when years ago, when this was being used, when system was updating, you were basically not able to use this Android device anymore. Your device would take around 30 minutes to install the update, and for that time, you will just see a loading screen saying, do not turn off your device. Please wait while system is being updated, and something like a warning message or so on. And once update were installed, your device reboot took way longer than a normal reboot, because you will obviously see a screen saying, optimizing applications, please wait, system is updated. Well, in short, updating system was around one hour task or something like that. And if you had, what, dozens of applications, well, simply go have a sleep, coffee, anything else that you want. And the worst part was that if the update was corrupt or you, it failed, your system used to went corrupt and you will have to visit the service center. You might have seen a lot of people saying, oh, I updated my phone and now it's not starting anymore. What do I do? Then you just go to service center, get it repaired. Because of these reasons, what Google did was they got inspired from the, their Chrome OS and copied how the updates were working on that into Android. And that new way is known as seamless update. The seamless, the word seamless simply indicates nothing without interruption. How does that work? Uh, very simple. The new devices which support seamless updates are known as AB devices. Again, I will explain what AB means in just another slide. This is the new way to update operating system on your Android devices since Android 8.0. So, um, this, the best part of this method is that it ensures that even if an update fails, your phone has a working operating system, which means that you don't have to visit service center anymore. You, your phone will simply try to boot the new update, and if it fails, it will simply go back to the current working operating system. Updates are installed in background, which means that you can keep using your Android phone. Nowadays, we do not even notice that our phone has updated, right? It just simply happens overnight. It just simply reboots one day and boom, new up system has been updated. And the best part, you don't need to worry about storage space issues anymore. Why? Because, well, everyone uses YouTube, right? Um, you all stream videos. You do not download them, right? You use them. You use them as you are watching and it doesn't take space on your device anymore. That's how the streaming update also work on your phone. Your phone does not download. It simply streams the update. It installs as it is being streamed. Now let's take a look on how this works and what is AB means. Now, here's how the storage space is now divided on new Android devices. 
Um, it's very simple and very <laughs> easy, so bear with me. Um, you will notice that there are now two blocks in red, right? And there are now two of all the system-related partitions or spaces. Notice there is a boot A, uh, there's a boot B. There's system A, there's system B. And there's vendor A, there's vendor B. Google, what Google decided was to simply, because when your phone updates, and it, if it fails to boot, it needs a working system to fall back. So what Google decided is that, well, simply let's double the um, number of partitions, because if we have a working system, always have a working system, we do not need to worry about anything else. This partition, so they call this scheme as AB, system A, system B. And that's what AB means. Because in old devices, if you remember, I'll just go back a couple of previous slides, there is no AB system. That's why this is non-AB. You notice there's only single partitions now. Well, on the new one, there are two of all the system-related partitions. Now, these partitions are also known as slots. So you basically, how do we differentiate among which partition we are using or what system we are using? So Google appended every partition with a slot. Uh, the top one, as you can see, is boot A. They appended with dash A. And they appended this with underscore B. So you differentiate between partition A, slot A, to partition B, slot B. How does this work? Let's say that today on your smartphone devices, you are running uh, your system is running on slot A. So when a new update comes, your updater application will install it on slot B. Slot B is unused. Your system is not using it at the moment, right? So it is totally safe to do anything it wants on slot B. Uh, when the update has finished, your system will simply mark that now the current system should be on the B slot. and you. It, you get usually get a notification or your smartphone reboots automatically over the night. And once that is done, the system simply sees, oh, now the B part, B slot is the active one. So I should use the operating system present on B slot. And then, voila, you have just a simple reboot and your smartphone is using an updated operating system. You did not have to wait for 30 minutes or something like that to get the update process done. And now you might wonder, how does my internal storage works? And the best part is that there's still just one user data partition of one internal storage, which is shared among both of these two systems. So your user data remains same as before. Now, what happens, let's say that my smartphone tried to boot the operating system B, but it failed. There's usually a number of retries that a system does, let's say three times. It will try to boot it three times, and if it fails, it will simply go back again to the slot A, which means your last known working operating system. So the best part, the operating system always has your phone, has a working operating system. It doesn't need to worry about anything else. Now let's see how this works. Because if you notice, as I mentioned on the legacy updates, that there was a recovery partition which was responsible for installing the updates, right? Res uh, recovery, cache, and misc, three partitions. And now there are double partitions. So there was storage space issue, because obviously manufacturer would say, we were already taking 10 GB of space. Now we don't want to take 20 GB of space, right? Because people will have less and less storage space if we keep doubling every system partition. So what Google did was Google killed the recovery, cache, misc, and all the partitions, the unused one. And what they come up with is something called a background daemon known as Update Engine. Uh, you can see its implementation in Android by scanning this QR code. It will open the API of Update Engine. Now, Update Engine is responsible for streaming and installing the updates, which means that if it's present on locally on the device, it can simply in install it. If you want to stream it, you can stream it as well. Once Update Engine has finished installing the update, it will mark the under slot as active, which I mentioned before, because obviously something needs to tell the system that we are going to use the under slot, the under partition as our operating system now. And once that is done, so you do a reboot of phone and you have the new operating system. Now, 
how can we use this knowledge to actually write a new OS updater application? Before we write a new OS updater application, obviously because Google is really good and it provides us with quite a lot of examples, right? We have code labs and things like that. Uh, fortunately, in AOSP, they also have a sample example application that you can take hints on how you can write an OS updater application. Here, if you scan this QR code, you will get the sample updater application from Google uh, on how you can write an updater application. Uh, it currently is located in the Android open source project's bootable recovery repository. It showcases you the, how the basic API of update engine works. The uh, QR code that I showed you earlier for the update engine, it shows you how that API works and how you can a developer can use it to write it, a new Android application. Uh, it also provides a very simple and easy Python script to generate the, an update configuration which you can host on your server so that the updater application can just simply read that and pass it to update engine and update engine will install or stream the update. However, as all things are not gold, uh, <laughs> this application is also not Gradle build system compatible, which means that you basically cannot compile it with Android Studio, which is what Android developer use. Uh, you need to download uh, AOSP, and only then you can compile it, and AOSP is around 100 GB in source, so yeah. And also, it is completely written in Java, and it is not asynchronous, which means it will crash if you close it. <laughs> yeah, and it was last updated four years ago. And the, the last commit is basically just adding an internet permission. Yeah, so four years ago, it's not updated at all. Uh, now, however, this sample app exists, so, but, as I said, this is a sample application. This application only shows you how to install the update from locally your device. It doesn't show you how in real world an Android application, a OS updater application can actually install the updates. When it comes to the real world use case, a normal updater app will have to communicate with a remote server, right? Your company will have a server on which it will host the update. A smartphone manufacturer, let's say Asus, has a, you know, like a server which their app communicates with, and then it downloads the update. After download, other than that, this application also need to automatically check for update because the user is not going to into your application all the time, clicking on check for update, check for update. Sm the application needs to be smart enough to automatically check for update and download and install it if it's existing. And finally, the application needs to handle different kind of errors. You don't want to be like sample application to just crash whenever a user closes your application. Because of this issue, we at Kilix actually wrote our own system of data application based on the sample ASP app. It's very simple, it has what? I think around 10 or 12 classes at most. It's very simple, it's less than one MB. You can scan this QR code to get our application source code. It's totally open source as well. Uh, this is completely written in Kotlin and Material 3. Uh, it uses the code new Kotlin state flow, uh, which is how the asynchronous things now work. Live data is not used anymore, kind of. So it, what it does is in backend, everything is handled by update engine, right? Update engine ha handles the downloading or streaming of your update. It handles the installation part. So what update engine does is update engine emits status on what it is doing right now. Let's say update engine is installing an update, so it will say downloading. If update engine is verifying the update, if the signature matches or not, it will say verifying and so on and so forth. So what it, this application does, it simply downloads the configuration from the remote server and it passes it to update engine. Then it simply takes what status code update engine is showing and shows it to the user in a very nice and beautiful way. That's all. We basically don't need to do anything in the new system updates way because everything, the big part, is handled by the update engine daemon. You don't need to do much. Now, this application also has a very useful benefit, which is that update engine, as I said, mentioned before, is coming from Chrome OS, right? It was originally written from Chrome OS. Then they adapted it for the Android. And as a result, there are quite a lot of status code which are not relevant to Android at all because update engine, for instance, cannot check for updates. 
update engine automatically check for updates on Chrome OS, not on Android. So you need to handle that part yourself. Uh, update engine cannot verify or your or update automatically. You need to do that yourself. So there are quite a lot of different status which update engine won't emit automatically. So our app kind of builds upon what update engine offers and doesn't tries to rewrite things. Let's take a look at how the update gets installed when we are building the application. Your application is usually in the idle state, which means that it's not doing anything. Then uh, you trigger an automatic update check. You can just use work manager library for that or anything else that you want. When it's checking for update, if an update is available, it will start to prepare to update. Let's say, um, Preparing to update is something that you want to do yourself. Let's say you want to verify if this is appropriate configuration or not for my device. You don't want to download 2 GB of update just to find out, oh, not compatible with my phone. This was some intern's mistake. I uh, don't wasted my user's data. You don't want to do that. So you do some custom configuration on preparing to update. And then if everything is fine, you move to downloading. If there's an error, you just puke an error code, and then you again check for updates. So the loop continues. Let's say that if the preparing to update goes well, you move into download. Now, as everything, uh, user can also pause downloading an update. So in update engine language, it is called suspending an update. So basically, a user can jump into the suspend mode and download mode as many times as they want. You cannot control that. But what you can do is allow user to suspend as many times as they want. However, once downloading is done, it moves to verification and finalizing stage. In this stage, user cannot suspend the update anymore. So now update engine will completely take over everything after downloading. So once verification and finalizing is done, um, update engine is happy with what you have provided, what it's getting, everything is totally safe, it will move it will update the system, and then you will get a status saying updated needs reboot. And then you can show your user a notification saying, please reboot your phone, or your phone will automatically reboot tonight at 2 o'clock when you're not using it. So basically, your user will not even know that the system automatically updated in the background while they were working in office or playing games on it. User does not need to do anything at all other than rebooting their phone which can also be done automatically at night when they're not using it. So totally seamless update happening in background. User does not need to do anything at all. If there's an error, you just basically check for update again. That's all. And the best part is that whenever there's an error, update engine automatically cleans up everything and it fixes and restores the system as it was before anything happened to it which means that you do not need to worry about any kind of errors, nothing. All you need to care about is checking for update, prepare to update, and reboot. That's all. So let's take a look at how you can very easily do that as well. As I mentioned before, Update Engine actually emits quite a lot of status code. Uh, this is taken from the header file, which I shared in a QR code before. So basically, these are the update status that an update engine can emit. Idle, checking for update, update available, downloading the update, verifying, finalizing, updated need reboot, and so on and so forth. And the bottom one, the three that you can see in our application are the custom one that we emit, the app emits, not the update engine, which is suspended because even if update engine pauses an update, it will still keep saying downloading the update. So your application needs to remember that, oh, user paused the update, and if and allow the user a chance to resume the update. Then there is the preparing to update. We at Calix run our own small check to ensure that the update that is being downloaded is actually compatible with the device. A uh, normal developer can run whatever the check they want in preparing to update. Now, how do you know what status code is the update engine actually doing? So there is this API that I copied 
an ex as an example from the QR code that I showed you before. This is present in system. This is basically an abstract class. You can extend the update engine callback class, and there is a highlighted method called on status update. On status update will get called by update engine as many times as there is a change in the update status and how that percentage. So it means that if your update is downloading, update engine will do an on status update. Status would be downloading and it will send like 1%, 2%, 3%. So you can basically use that to simply show in the UI how much update has been downloaded. If it's being installed, simply show a progress bar. That's all. It's very simple and easy. Now, as I mentioned before, that there are some custom codes, right? Because update engine will not do everything for you. It's coming from Chrome OS, so you need to adapt uh, something for Android. At Calyx, I know a system updater. What we do is we restore the last update status, then we bind with the update engine. We bind our application, which basically connects our application with update engine and lets update engine know that update engine should send its status updates on this class. Afterwards, update engine will simply start sending the status update to the, your class. Then we launch a coroutine scope, which is the asynchronous way, and we launch a flow, which is, let's say, update status in this case. What update status does is that checking for update, as I mentioned before, update engine cannot do that for you. So you do not want that status code from, obviously, update engine. You want to handle that in with your own. So when update engine sends checking for update, because update engine will send checking for update, uh, it will simply not do anything. In other case, it will simply store the, the last known status of the update. And it will just simply pass the update progress to the application. Now, how do you check for updates? Checking for updates is very easy. You just use the Google's Work Manager Library. Google has a really good documentation on Work Manager Library. In this case, what we do is we trigger our own system update service, uh, which is a foreground service. It simply, what does it does? It, it checks for update on our own server. And if there is an update available, it will download and apply it. Now, as I mentioned before, before downloading the update, you want to prepare for update because you want to check if the update file that is being downloaded, the 2GB file, is actually valid for your device or not. Uh, notice the highlighted code. Uh, that's the update engine's method called verify payload metadata. Verify payload metadata basically accepts a meta metadata file of the update and it will simply return a Boolean value, which means if it returns true, the update is compatible with your device and you can actually download the update later on. If it's not, it will send false. Uh, in that case, we just say failed preparing for update and cancel it, the process. For downloading, nothing. you need to almost nothing. We just emit a simple status saying downloading and we call the update engine apply payload method. What does that take? Now that takes your update configurations URL, uh, where your update is located in the server. You, you pass it a URL, you pass it the offsets of the file, which obviously you will know because you are the one hosting it on the remote server. Uh, then you just pass it the properties, which is the update configuration that you generated and hosted on your server. With just these four parameters and one function, update engine will do rest of the takeover. You do not need to do anything else. Update engine will keep applying that. If there's an error, update engine will let you know. If it, everything is done, update engine will still let you know. And all you need to do is reboot the device. As I mentioned also, that user can download, can pause and resume the update. Update engine has two methods, called update engine uh, suspend and resume. So this basically allows a user to pause the update and resume the update whenever they wish. Now, errors, I'm not going to talk about errors quite a lot because there can be tons of errors that can happen when a user is, when you are developing an application. But the most common errors that comes is because of missing permissions. Ensure your server and your Android operating system actually uses the proper certificates. If there's a certificate mismatch, uh, update engine will fail to update the Android US operating system. Then obviously there is SLinux on um, SLinux Android uses SLinux, so ensure that there are proper SLinux rules for update engine and your apli Android application. 
obviously verify the files that you are downloading. It has proper permissions. Then updating your updater application needs to run in background, right? It needs to know what's going on. So there's also that. Other than that, nothing, nothing at all. Um, any questions? All right, no sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.